Hi, it's wonderful to be here. It's wonderful to see so many friendly faces. I know that everybody in this room is as thrilled as I am to be here with one of the most singular and significant writers working in the world today. Um, Kang has very kindly agreed to read for us, so we'll do a very short reading, and then we'll talk for a bit, and then there will be a lot of time for audience questions. Walker, is, is this okay? Okay. <laughs> Good evening. Mm. Uh, we are going to read paragraph by paragraph. So I'm going to read in Korean. <laughs> 밤은 고요하지 않다. 반 블록 넘어에서 들리는 고속도로의 굉음이 여자의 고막에 수천 개의 스케이트 날 같은 칼금을 긋는다. 흉터 많은 꽃잎들을 사방에 떨구기 시작한 자목련이 가로등 불빛에 빛난다. 가지들이 휘도록 흐드러진 꽃들의 육감, 으깨면 단 냄새가 날것 같은 봄밤의 공기를 가로질러 그녀는 걷는다. 자신의 뺨에 아무것도 흐르지 않는다는 것을 알면서 이따금 두 손으로 얼굴을 닦아낸다. The night is disturbed. The roar of engines from a motorway half a block away makes incisions in her eardrums like countless skate blades on ice. The lily magnolia, lit by the glow from the street lights, scatters its bruised petals to the winds. She walks past the voluptuous blooms, straining the branches, and through the spring night air, which is thick with an anticipatory sweetness of crushed petals. She occasionally raises her hands to her face, despite the knowledge that her cheeks are dry. 전단지와 세금 고지서들이 꽂혀 있는 우편함을 지나쳐 엘리베이터 옆에 육중하게 버티고 선 1층 현관문에 그녀는 열쇠를 꽂는다. 다시 양육권 소송을 해서 되찾아올 생각이었으므로 집안에는 아이의 흔적이 고스란히 남아있다. 낡은 천 소파 옆에 낮은 책장에는 세살 때부터 읽힌 그림책들이 꽂혀 있고 동물 스티커로 장식한 골판지 상자들에는 크고 작은 레고 부속들이 그득하다. Passing by the letterbox, which is stuffed full with leaflets and tax notices, she slides the key into the lock of the ground floor front door, a ponderous, enduring presence next to the cold gleam of the lift. The flat is filled with traces of the child, things she's refused to put away, convinced that one more court proceeding would be sufficient to get him back. The low bookcase next to the old velvet sofa is stuffed full of picture books they began reading together when he was two, while various Lego bricks are kept in corrugated cardboard boxes decorated with animal stickers. 수년 전, 아이가 마음껏 놀게 하려고 일부러 맨 아래층에 얻은 집이었다. 하지만 아이는 좀처럼 발을 구르거나 뛰어다니려 하지 않았다. 거실에서 줄넘기 연습을 해도 된다고 그녀가 말하자 아이는 물었다. 지렁이랑 달팽이들이 시끄러워하지 않을까? She'd chosen this place many years ago, on the ground floor so her son could play freely. But he had shown no desire to stamp his feet or run about. When she told him it was okay to use a skipping rope in the living room, he asked, but won't it be noisy for the worms and snails? 구두를 벗지 않은 채 그녀는 현관 턱에 걸터 앉는다. 두툼한 히라버 교본과 사전, 공책과 납작한 필통이 들어있는 가방을 내려놓는다. 노란 빛이 도는 센서 등이 꺼질 때까지 눈을 감고 기다린다. 어두워지자 그녀는 눈을 뜬다. 어둠 때문에 검게 보이는 가구들을, 검은 커튼을, 정적에 잠긴 검은 베란다를 본다. 
천천히 입술을 열었다가 이내 악문다. She sits down on the raised step inside her front door without removing her shoes. She puts her bag down beside her, which contains a thick Greek textbook and dictionary, her exercise book, and a flat pencil case. She keeps her eyes closed and waits until the yellow sensor light shifts, switches off. Once it goes dark, she opens her eyes. She looks at the black furniture hunkered down in the darkness, the black curtain, the black veranda sunk in stillness. Very slowly, she opens her lips, then presses them together. 심장에 장전된 차디찬 폭약을 향해 타들어가던 불꽃은 없다. 더 이상 피가 흐르지 않는 혈관의 내부처럼 작동을 멈춘 승강기의 통로처럼 그녀의 입술 안쪽은 텅 비어 있다. 여전히 말라 있는 뺨을 그녀는 손등으로 닦아낸다. The lit fuse of the chilly explosive primed in her heart is no more. The interior of her mouth is as empty as the veins through which the blood no longer flows. It is as empty as a lift shaft where the lift has ceased to operate. She wipes her cheeks, dry as ever, with the back of her hand. 눈물이 흘렀던 길에 지도를 그려뒀더라면 말이 흘러나왔던 길에 바늘자국을 빗자국이라도 새겨뒀더라면 If only she'd made a map of the route her tears used to take. If only she used a needle to engrave pinpricks or even just traces of blood. Over the route where the words used to flow. 하지만 너무 끔찍한 길이었어. 혀와 목구멍보다 깊은 곳에서 그녀는 중얼거린다. But she mutters, from a place deeper than tongue and throat, that was too terrible a route. Thank you so much. Thank you. I, I wondered if I could start with a very simple question, which is about language. All your novels are very much concerned with language, but it's really at the heart of this novel in particular. And the central protagonist, or one of the two protagonists who we meet in this passage, has a very charged relationship with language. I wonder if you could speak a little bit about her relationship. With language? Yeah. Oh. So she is a poet, and uh, ever since she was a child, she has been you no know, attracted to language, and at the same time, there is a certain pain about language for her. And now uh, she has uh, lost language and she wants to regain it and there is this uh, complex uh, state, inner state in her uh, because she cannot stand language but at the same time she is desperate to retrieve her language there's a wonderful line which I, I remember, I was so struck by it, where she's remembering the meeting point where, I think she says, of loose meaning, where the meaning of language loosens, and, and she describes it as a slow-burning fuse of elation and transgression was lit. And I wondered if that point where language and meaning loosens, the bind loosens a little bit, is particularly what excites her about language, and I wondered if if that was also something that was interesting to you as a writer. Yeah, as everybody knows, language is slippery and, you know, and you always uh, fail if you want to be really accurate. And it's like, for me, it's like uh, you, uh, can I say, your arrows are always failing the target every moment but it's like uh, there is this only medium for me and for her as well and I have 
have to deal with this, but no, yeah, there is, can I say, mm. and we have you no, know, these complex emotions in our lives, and definitely language is carrying the emotions, so sometimes whenever we feel our emotions are tattered and then suddenly our language itself becomes in tattered so uh, it's, yeah, we language something so I wanted to deal with uh, the language this complexity of language and I imagined a woman who has lost her language but and who is desperate to regain it. I was interested, y you know, it's, it's one of the most, um, in a way, volatile descriptions of a relationship to language that I've ever read. It really changes, there are many, many layers to it. But one thing I was struck by w was the fact that you focus in particular in the retreat from speech, so language as speech. You know, she has a troubled relationship to written language as well, but with speech, in not being able to speak, there is also a kind of act of, of almost refusal of some kind, or a kind of rejection of a prevailing social order. And I think at one point she even says, I, I don't speak for, because I'm in a world where there is an unhoused person suffering on the street. And, I wondered if you could speak a little bit about about speech and language and speech as an action. Uh, yeah, I was thinking about this word which uh, this character cannot reconcile with and and because of this irreconciliation mm. uh, she cannot use her only medium of her life because language is so important for her and it is kind of the primary uh, mode of her life. So, yeah, when, s uh, as for the part you talked, you know, she has this, you know, feeling of irreconciliation and yeah but it's it's like a kind of a sword with a double blaze and 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 it is the only tool for her to regain her life but and and he and she wants to grasp it but it's impossible so <laughs> um i I wondered if we could turn now to the second character in, in the novel, who is a, a teacher of, of Greek, um, and the, the female character is in his class. And he also has a charged relationship with language, but for quite different reasons. He's lived in Germany for exactly mm -hmm. half his life, and when we meet him, he's newly arrived, or newly returned, rather, to South Korea. Um, and he inhabits two multiple languages in a way. He, he moves between kind of German and Korean and of course ancient Greek, which is a dead language. I wonder if you could speak a little bit about that choice to look at multiplicity of languages through his character. Mm. Uh, so there are two uh, protagonists in this book and they're narratives are interwoven and, and I didn't give them names and uh, very slowly uh, they are, can I say, they are getting very slowly close to each other and when they are together I hoped uh, their presences are getting mingled in a way and and so I thought uh, if uh, he uh, 
has these two languages and his whole life is divided into two languages and two cultures and and definitely that's how he is so sensitive about language as she is sen maybe not so much as she is uh, sensitive but she is no he is awake about this uh, delicacy of language and and uh, as for uh, the woman as well uh, because you know she lives on without language and uh, and every uh, her every sensation and perception is very vivid without language and and it's the uh, same condition which the man is e experiencing because he is losing his sight and it's kind of uh, auto self no, self portrait of everyone in you no know, everyone who is losing our world or our life slowly and we are we are moving to the disappearance and darkness so his sensation is uh, getting more vivid and because he knows that he is losing his word and so uh, in a way they are feeling in the almost same way so yeah so I imagine this man who spent the half of his life in Korea and then the other half in Germany. Um, I, I want to, to ask you more about the, your rendering of, of loss through sensation, um, but I, I, I just want to ask, a, I guess, a, a further um, question, which is that in, in, in the female character section, we have a voice that is rendering a kind of mind that wants to escape language, it, it seemed to me very much. And I, I felt that with the male character, with the teacher, he still had quite a lot of faith in mm -hmm. language as a form of contact. Um, for, for many passages in his section, he uses a second person. He addresses mm -hmm. a you, which is often somebody he has loved and, and lost, whether it's a kind of object of unrequited love or a sibling or, or a friend. Um, and he still seems to believe that that language is a mode of persuasion where she seems to have far fewer illusions about what language is. Do, is, that, is that accurate or? Yes, so the man is writing, you know, always. There are three letters which, uh, which couldn't reach uh, uh, the recipients, but he's writing over and over again so and he speaks many languages like german korean and sign language as well so he wants to believe in uh, connection and he has this very gentle attitude to everyone and he, he can carry his, you know, uh, very gentle uh, approach to people in our <coughs> eyes. You know, so, yeah. It, it, um, I, I wonder, you know, the voices feel very distinct in the first, uh, very, very different at the beginning of the novel, the first person voice of this male character and the more dream-infused and fragmented third person of the female character. But when you were speaking about how they come into contact with each other, I wondered if that was reflected in the quality of the voice, because the book kind of ends really with a, with a poem, and it seems like there's a merging of these two voices together so that there, there is, in fact, a point of contact that is rendered through the form of, of the novel itself. Mm. Uh, suddenly, uh, I suddenly a scene came to me and where 
where um, an index finger of its nails are so severely cut and that they cannot harm anyone, um, anything, and and then the finger is writing sentences or phrases on a palm mm, in darkness, and you no. Know, that's how they are connected in the end. And, and then uh, I wanted to put uh, much silence uh, in between so many lines. And sometimes the lines are short, like a word or, you know, so it's like I want to describe their moments in silence, their tactile moments, and yeah, the language and the silence all together. And, and, and that moment, which is extraordinary and I extraordinarily moving with the, with the finger with short nails that can't hurt, that is, that is finally writing again on yeah. his palm. And it seems that the reason why she is able to fine language again is because it's transient and I think she even says that, that it's a form of writing, I don't know if she mm -hmm. said a form of writing, but it's a kind of writing that isn't permanent and it seems as if that's counter to the writing she would have done as a poet mm -hmm. and, and perhaps to some extent as a teacher is, is that it's ephemeral quality of the writing mm -hmm. that is where their contact is located. Mm -hmm. I, I wondered if I could um, Richard, you, you mentioned the double-edged sword of uh, which language is to her, and, and the novel opens with a, a reference to Borges, who of course also mm -hmm. lost his vision over the course of his life, and, and, and one of the things that's the epitaph on his gravestone, which is, um, I've written it down, he took the sword and laid the naked metal between them, and the, the male character who is losing his sight um, describes the loss of sight as the knife between me and the world. And it's, it's an extraordinary image. Um, it seemed to me to summarize so much of what I is so striking to me about your work, which is, is its relative um, quiet and these extraordinary images of violence in the middle of them. I wondered if you could talk about that, that knife that is cutting him, mm. that lies between him and the world? Uh, when, I, uh, when I got to know that uh, Borges wanted to engrave uh, this line on his tombstone, I, um, I felt I maybe I, I could understand a bit uh, why he chose uh, the sentence, and mm, even in Greek lessons, which uh, is uh, it gets very slow and you know, and it is kind of you no know, deserving into silence, but there uh, underneath the surface there is certain. Uh, violence and tension, and I, for me, I, I have this uh, feeling of this uh, presence of violence, which is omnipresent, maybe since uh, my childhood, and there is always, there has been always inner conflict, that conflict that. Uh, I want to embrace this life and world, and there is certain you no know, blade, uh, you no. Know, so, yeah, you can call the blade a language or you no know, omnipresence of violence or whatever. And there, there exists this uh, blade between us and life or the world. Mm. I, I, you know, when I think about your work, 
I'm often struck by by the incredibly delicate qualities that it has and your extraordinary capacity to render violence in, in on the page. And you know, I think with almost any other writer, I would think of those almost as two opposing qualities, but I feel in your work they're possibly closely related and that possibly it's it's through that delicacy that, that violence is reached. But I, I I wondered if I could I could ask you to speak about that because it, it's a quality in your writing that is, is really like nobody else I can think of, but it is precisely the restraint, the um, almost minimal uh, quality of the prose, that, particularly in, in Greek lessons or in a book like the White Book, um, but at the same time you are able, the human acts is, is an extraordinary record of violence among many other things. And even in a book like Greek lessons, as, as those of you who have read it, will know something as seemingly minor as a bird flying into a stairwell can absolutely, you know, be horrifying in your hand. So I wondered if I could, how do you move between those? Are, are those polarities for you? Or how, how do you render that? I thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah, I just want to be vivid. I mean, I want to feel vivid and mm, and I just try to render the vividness into the sentences I write. And it, it's kind of a miracle that <laughs> <laughs> that the readers can feel the uh, <laughs> vividness. It's, it's the miracle of language, you know, even, even though language is an impossible tool, but sometimes it happens, so... <laughs> I, I wondered, um, the novel has so, many, so much loss in it. There are so many different forms of loss. I mean, in the passage that you read, there is the um, central protagonist's loss of her child, for example, who's kind of haunts the book in many ways, um, who's, who's not dead but has been, she's lost custody of, of him. How did you reach, you spoke about this a little bit earlier, but how did you reach the decision to render that loss through sense, because the two characters are, she has lost her ability to speak, he is losing his vision, um, and that gives this very s almost saturated um, uh, s kind of sensitivity to the novel, but how did you come to that decision to use the realm of the senses as, as a kind of metaphor? Well, it's hard to explain because so many motives are, you know, mm, getting crossed and met all together whenever I start to write a novel. And you know, so mm, I was in a, a hiatus uh, for one year before I wrote uh, Greek lessons. Yeah, one year, and you know, I couldn't. But I didn't take Greek lessons, but no, <laughs> I I couldn't read and write fiction, and I couldn't endure and stand fiction, and I felt I almost I was almost losing my medium, and yeah, but s for some reason I recovered and I. I could write on and I could finish my fourth novel. But this is my fifth novel. So after that, after I finished uh, my fourth novel, I imagined a, a character who has lost, who lost her language. And, um, and you know, I, in that period of hiatus, I, I couldn't read fiction, but I don't know why. Borges was an exception. So I could savor uh, his work. So, and I imagined uh, that condition uh, that you are losing your sight for all your life. 
And Borges told in an interview, maybe losing your sight slowly is like uh, like expecting summer night. You know, the summer nights are coming very slowly. So, and I imagined it, and yeah, and, and everything met uh, each other on another, and, and I remembered uh, my uh, conversation with my publisher, who whose major was ancient Greek philosophy, and he talked about the very intriguing points of the language and. And then everything got mingled all together, and it became this book. <laughs> <laughs> um, in the past, you, you've, you've spoken about grief and trauma as things um, that are not to be healed, but rather things that should be held close, and that it's a way of providing a place for the dead amongst the living. I, I wondered if, if, if that was something you were exploring in this novel, because it it does feel very much that we are inhabiting that loss of vision, that loss of speech, that loss of family and and the and the child, um, and that it is in that sense haunted. It's not haunted in a in a literal way by a ghost, but there is this kind of eerie feeling to the book because of that. Yes, yes, it's, uh, uh, as I told you, the man's condition is uh, just, just uh, of us, you know, because we are losing the word. And then, you know, there are such things we are losing. And, and, and I imagined, when I was writing this book, my my child was like ten years old, so I imagine the most painful experience I and then I imagine this uh no this loss of uh hers. So yeah, but uh I actually she uh she is. Uh, she doesn't speak as I, the first person perspective, but only in on the last page she speaks as I, and and it's kind of spoiler, but and <laughs> 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 uh, uh, yes, but she doesn't speak. You know, it, it this ends with the moment she is about to speak. So. Mm, it's is dealing with loss, uh, definitely, but it is moving toward the light and you know, the connection and, and resilience. So, so there is, for you, a way in which the book is moving towards healing in the final... Mm, yeah. so there is a recovery from, from loss and from there is. Yeah, I, I don't like the word healing. <laughs> But it's kind of we cannot. It's not easy to be healed, you know. You we can embrace our loss or condition, and yes. I, I wondered if I could ask you a question about about translation because I think it it's um, it, it seems present in this book in so many ways, particularly with the character of the of the teacher, and I wondered how you. <coughs> you experience and think about translation. You know, it's um, of this kind of layering of languages, this layering of consciousness. And, and I wondered, um, you know, what your relationship with your translators is, um, how closely you, you work with them. Uh, uh, to be frank, I don't uh, put... Uh, my time to this pro translation process because I have to write on my <laughs> new books. 
so yeah, I don't have much time, no. So I just try to trust my translators, and yeah, that's the best way for writers. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, do you, I? I often. I know a lot of writers think of translation as a kind of act of collaboration where you don't actually have to talk to the person, but you are collaborating on the text. Is it, is it like that f for you, or, or is it really it's done when it's done and you move on? Well, it's, I don't feel it is collaboration, and because, um, yes, uh, for Greek lessons, there are uh, two translators, and they collaborated and they compared every line, you know, and so I read the first proof uh, which uh, my editor sent to me, and then there were some, you know, yellow marks on the you know, documents, and, and then I answered their questions, and so that's how I worked. S if it if you can call that work. <laughs> it it sounds like work to me. <laughs> yeah, but uh, so as for the previous three books of, uh, you know, which are uh, translated into English, it's all I it all depended uh, on my situation. So as for the vegetarian, uh, when I received the per first proof, I was so immersed uh, in writing human acts, and it was like the last pay, last phase of, you know, finishing that novel, and it demanded a lot. So I couldn't spare much time. It's, it's like three or four hours. Just I didn't look up dictionary you notes. Know, I'm quite slow, and I want to read uh, English, read in English, because I have to look up dictionaries. But I didn't look up the dictionary. I just you know, flipped through the translation. I should have, uh, <laughs> I should have you know, given more energy to that translation. I regret, but uh, it happened that way. But after that, uh, for human acts, I had time. I didn't have. I didn't know. I wasn't writing anything at that moment. So, yeah, I tried to communicate with my translator. Maybe I, yeah, I I wrote. Sometimes I wrote one page to explain the uh, particular Korean political context. And and for the white book, this is rather short and it's kind of you know you can call it prose poem as well. So it's kind of it literally we sat side by side and we compared every line. But you no, know, you cannot do that with the novel. So yeah, I think. Uh, I don't, I don't think I can do that, uh, like the white book or human acts afterwards. You know, I have to tr trust my translators. Can I uh, ask just a quick question about which you you referred to writing human acts, and I, I, it's such an extraordinary novel. I can't imagine the process of writing it, both in terms of writing it and, and the research that was involved. I wondered if you could speak a little bit about that experience. I imagine it was exa <laughs> exhausting. It was, uh, it was painful and it was a very strange uh, period of, of my life which uh, transformed me uh yeah and and the pain was so overwhelming and it it was like crying every day and it was like you cry 
when you just cross the road and when you are just on the subway and, and just uh, I read an interview of uh, um, Bobby Hakja a forensic scientist Sorry. <laughs> and, and he he confessed uh, in his interview that he cries a lot suddenly and then when he went on a vacation and he was on the he was sitting on the beach and suddenly he went wanted to mm, wanted to go inside the ocean and just he didn't want to come back and i think i experienced a similar uh, state and no and after that but i think human acts is also moving toward the light and it starts with all those materials and, and the testimony book uh, testifying all human uh, atrocity, and but they are te testifying this unbelievable uh, human mm, dignity in front of all the violence. So I wanted to cross the can I say two cliffs from the at atrocity to this side of human beings and it, that experience um, has transformed formed myself but afterwards uh, I wanted to deal with uh, my kind of my experience my own experience uh, s which was overwhelming and and I dealt with it and then I wrote about it I starting with my own experience and that is the uh, that is my most recent novel which was published two years ago and the title is we do not part and which is going to be published in America next year mm. I'm looking for the Hogarth <laughs> faces <laughs> Um, that was actually my, my next question, which is, what is the next novel that will be published? And it, so it's a novel that is starting with your experience of yeah, writing right. Human Acts. Yeah. Wonderful. Can I ask one last question before we open it up to, to questions from the audience, which is, who, who are the, I, the kind of young Korean writers that we should all be reading, particularly people who maybe haven't been translated into English yet? Haven't been translated, translated? maybe into English. Mm -hmm. There are so many. <laughs> <laughs> there are so many. If I recommend uh, Hwang jong -un, who has uh, two translated books already, and Che jin uh, she's very nice. And there are so many, I cannot, I don't want to miss one, so yeah. Yeah, yeah. Are good. yeah. Thank you. So if there are questions from the audience, there are mics. Hi, thank you so much for the talk. Yeah. It was really wonderful. I just was kind of curious on the translation aspect in terms of like this book itself was published in you know, like 2011 when you wrote it and it's translated now today. So I'm just wondering how it feels as a writer to kind of see your book translated and you know popularized 10 years after writing it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, but somehow I feel this book very close to me, maybe uh, because I spent two years writing this and it is very short and maybe I wanted to stay in this book as long as uh, I can. Sorry for my editor, <laughs> but <you> know, <laughs> I kept brushing and brushing and I, you know, if you finish a novel, you 
are kind of you no. Know, you don't belong to the world anymore. So, yeah. So I feel until now I feel very close to this book and, and this um, and no. And it is strange because last year uh, in Korea, my publisher had this. Oh, they did. Uh, they did a new print, a new printed edition of uh, Greek of lessons, and so I, I asked myself maybe because this time, you know, the world is getting more difficult to read, and so maybe they. Maybe because of it, they want to read this kind of books. I mean, because in this book, uh, the tempo is getting slow and slow, and and then I wanted uh, the tempo like eternity, and uh, and in the tempo, I wanted all the sensations to become vivid and. It's as I wanted to stay in this moment, maybe it's because maybe it will be because there was a reprinted edition in Korea and and no and it's published in English as well. Can I quickly ask, did you revise the text at all for the new Korean edition or did you No not a word. <laughs> Hi, thank you for such an amazing talk. Oh my God, now I'm a little bit nervous. Um, uh, I've been lucky enough to read your books both in Korean and in English, and I have noticed significant details being different within maybe specific books and certain translations. Um, especially when I read your books in Korean, there's something that feels so quintessentially Korean to me about, about your language and literature. I'm wondering, you know, because you have such an international audience, is that something that you think about during the writing process, about how to convey that once, you know, the book is out in the world and is translated into so many different languages? Uh, actually, we have this wonderful interpreter, so I'd like to take advantage of her. <laughs> <laughs> mm, uh, 사실은 제가 음, 글을 쓸때 그렇게 독자들을 의식하지는 않아요. Um, I don't when I'm writing I don't really write with a reader in mind per se. Sorry. Uh, <웃음> 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 uh, 왜냐하면 제가 소설을 끝낼 수 있을지에 대한 어떤 걱정이 항상 있기 때문이에요. And this is because I'm always worried whether I'll actually be able to finish what I'm writing. <laughs> so it's like, uh, um, 나는 이 소설을 끝낼 수 있다는 희망과 어쩌면 못 끝낼지도 모른다는 걱정 사이에서 서성거리는데요. It's almost as if I'm going back and forth between the hope of being able to finish this book and the, the possible despair that I'm feeling of possibly not being able to finish the book. So... Uh, there is no room for <laughs> the readers, mm, even international readers. So. <laughs> and uh, 최근에 제가 마지막으로 쓴 어, 작은 어, 노벨라, 어, 조금 긴 단편 소설에는 한국어로 된 말놀이가 나와요. 끝말잇기라고 하는 건데요. Um, so recently I wrote like a longer short story of mine and it features a Korean game called Gummariki and it's basically you're um, connecting the last um, word of a sen uh, of a word into um, and into making that into a newer word using that end word as the front word as the front letter of another word sorry um. so I'm worried about the translation <laughs> 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 Hi.
Hi. Oh, I feel the nervousness as well. <laughs> But, um, if I'm remembering correctly, you mentioned something about before writing Greek lessons, you were losing access to the medium of writing, and somehow you're able to find your way back to the medium. I was wondering if you could talk more about how you're able to come back to the medium. It was not through Greek lessons, but. Mm, Ah, yeah, that was, uh, it was my fourth book, and uh, the title is Parami Bunda Kara. I, I have to. Ah, uh, 런데 어, 이거는 미스터리 구조를 가진 책인데요. 음, 400페이지가 넘는 긴 책입니다. Um, so the book that did it for me is uh, a book by the tel a title of Parami Punda. Um, I will say um, that would translate to The Wind Blows Go. Um, it, the t it's, it's, it's a mystery. It's structured as a mystery novel. It's a pretty large, it's a pretty long book that's over 400 pages. 그래서 저는 300페이지까지 쓰은 다음에 그 1년간의 히아투스가 있었어요. So after I wrote 300 pages of this book, I had like about a year-long hiatus after writing 300 pages. 어 이거는 제한 어 채식주의자 바로 다음에 쓰여진 책인데요. This was written right after I wrote The Vegetarian. 어 채식주의자의 마지막 장면에서 어 영혜 언니 인혜가 어 앰뷸런스 밖을 내다보면서 스스로에게 묻는 장면이 있습니다. Um, so there's a last scene in the veg vegetarian where um, the character Inhe looks out of the ambulance and is asking herself a question. Uh, almost as if she's opposing something, almost as if she's waiting for an answer. So for me, the vegetarian is a is a novel where I'm actually waiting for an answer. 어, 그 소설을 쓴 다음에 저는 어떤 인물을 상상했는데 자신의 목숨을 걸고 자신의 어, 가장 친한 친구의 죽음이 자살이 아니라고 어, 증명하고자 하는 그런 여성을 상상했습니다. So after writing that book, a character came to my mind where um, she is trying to prove that the, the suicide of her friend is not a suicide. That's a character that came to me in that time. 그래서 그 400페이지 동안 이 여성이 계속 어, 싸우면서 용감하게 끝까지 삶 쪽으로 기어가는 어, 그런 모습을 보여주는데요. So what the character shows us through the 400 pages of her journey is that she is really fighting courageously toward life. 그래서 그 소설을 쓰면서 어쩌면 그 소설의 마지막 100페이지를 쓰므로써 어 그것을 쓰겠다고 결심하면서 어쩌면 제가 가졌던 그 언어에 대한 고통이 조금은 어 나아졌던 것 같아요. So I think it was while writing those last 100 pages of that book or deciding to write those last 100 pages of the book is when I think was a point in my life where the pain lessened for me uh, using language as a medium, I think. 그리고 그 경험이 어, 어, 일하버 시간을 쓰는 데에도 분명히 영향을 줬을 거라고 생각합니다. And I definitely feel that ex experience also influenced my experience writing uh, Greek lessons as well. 음, 그리고 그네 번째 소설이 아주 어, fierce 하기 때문에 어쩌면 어, 그 다음 소설에서는 굉장히 부드러운 인간의 어떤 부분을 상상하고 싶었어요. And so I think because my fourth novel really has a very intense ferociousness to it, I think um, the next novel, uh, because of that, became uh, wanting to be a, a process of uh, talking about the softest parts of being human. Thank you. Um, you had spoken uh, 
about uh, trying not to think of the audience when you're writing. And I was wondering if that process had to change for you with human acts, since that book is so rooted in the collective experience of Guangzhou. Uh, uh, 내가 독자를 생각하지 않는다고 했던 것은 좀 <웃음> 그냥 제가 글을 쓰는 그 순간 순간에는 생각하지 않는다는 것이고요. 제가 글을 쓰는 의미에 대해서 고민할 때에는 당연히 독자들을 생각합니다. So what I meant by not thinking about readers when I write is actually in the moment-to-moment -moment experience when I'm actually writing my works. When it comes to thinking about the meaning of what my uh, works will take on, I definitely there is some consideration that I put into that. 음, 그리고 소년이 온다가 그런 어, 저의 생각을 많이 어, 정말 이것을 읽는 사람들에 대해서 많이 생각하게 했던 소설인 것이 사실입니다. And Human Acts definitely is one of those books where I really had to think about that impact. So because there are actual people who have lived through this event that is narrated in the book, and that there are people who are trying to twist the narrative on what actually happened uh, during that time, I remember thinking that if my book can bring about change um, in any kind of way in the perception of the events that happened, um, that would make me so happy, and that would, I would feel so lucky if that were possible.